Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to see everybody back, and uh, again, I guess you've all had your coffee. I think it's really going through fast today, isn't it? But anyway, uh, all of you out in television, again, we'd like to welcome you to just an informal Bible study. And uh, for those of you that are brand new, you've probably just caught us in the last week or two. We uh, have gone all the way from Genesis up through the Old Testament, New Testament, and pretty much hit all the highlights. And now we're just coming back and uh, picking up some of the things that we skimmed over. The book of Isaiah is one of them, and we'll probably do a few others like this. So we're back in Isaiah. For those of you in the studio, you're in chapter 44 now, verse 1. And for those of you out in television, if you call in for uh, the book or tape that contains this program, we are in book number 61. And uh, this is the first four programs in that one. So remember that book 61 if you call in. All right. Isaiah chapter 44, we'll just skip over those remaining verses in chapter 43. Now verse 1, Yet now hear, O Jacob, this is the Lord, of course, speaking, and again he refers to them as my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Now you've got to remember, God uses those two terms interchangeably and sometimes together. Uh, we have to be careful that uh, we don't lose sight of the fact that the ten tribes of the north were called Israel and the two tribes of the south were called Judah, but nevertheless we use the terms Jacob and Israel, Israel pretty much uh, in unison. All right, so Jacob my servant and Israel whom I have chosen, verse 2, thus saith the Lord that made thee. So what does that make him? The Creator. I form thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou Jeshurun, that's just another title for Israel, the upright ones, whom I have chosen. Now you want to remember, I won't take you back and show you the verses, but you remember the Lord said to Israel, I have not chosen you because you are the greatest. He didn't choose them because they were the most powerful nation on earth. He didn't choose them for any reason whatsoever, but by His grace. By His grace, He chose them and set them aside to be the chosen or the covenant people. All right, reading on. Verse 5, One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob. Another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. See how synonymous they are? Thus saith the Lord the, what again? Now I want you to see these things. This constant reference to the Lord, Jehovah, God the Son, as Israel's king. Oh, he's not ruling over them yet. But this is future, that one day he's going to be their king of kings and lord of lords. All right, so verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer. See how the two go hand in hand? The Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last. What does that remind you of? Revelation. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The first letter of the alphabet, I am the last letter of the alphabet. I am beginning and end. All through Scripture, see? I am the last. Beside me there is no God. And who, as I shall call and shall declare it and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, he is the God of the future. Verse 8, fear not, neither be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? You are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know of none. All right. I was reminded of, do you remember the name Ingersoll, the great, famous agnostic or atheist? This is sort of, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I can't quote it exactly, but this is what the man said. The God of the Bible is proud and arrogant. Who does he think he is? Isn't that something? Well, nobody but an atheist could say something like that because he has every right to be. He can be arrogant if he wants to be. He can be totally absolute. 
because he is the God over everything. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to do. It's his universe. If he wants to wipe it out tomorrow, that's his prerogative. The only reason he won't is because he has promised a better future than that for the believer. But he could if he wanted to. He's sovereign. And I've been stressing that in all the years that I've been on television, that the God of this Bible is sovereign. Nobody can argue with him. Nobody can debate him. He can do whatever he wants. All right? Verse 9. Now we come back to the idolatry again. They that make a graven image are all vanity. Their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witnesses, and they see not. In other words, Israel, with the background that they had in their history and with their scriptures, they should have known better. How could they fall into the worship of wood and stone and metal, as we're going to see here in just a minute? All right? They are their own witnesses. They see not, reading on in verse 9, nor know that they may be ashamed. My, they should have just been embarrassed to tears to have their neighbor step in the door and see that idol up on the mantel. That's what they should have been, but they weren't. Now verse 10, Who hath formed a god? Small g, so it's an idol. Who hath formed a god or a molten, a graven image that is profitable for how much? Nothing. Those idols can't accomplish anything. Verse 11, Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. Who? These makers of idols. Now here they come. Now remember, this is 700 B.C. And every time I read this, I'm immediately taken back to my days when I was in high school and shortly after, back in the 40s and so forth. And you go to the village blacksmith. And what did every blacksmith have? A forge. Come on, you older people know that. What was the forge? Well, it was that place where they had the pile of coals and something to blow the air up from underneath them whether it was hand-run bellows or later on came an electric motor, but they would blow that wind up through that coal until it would get what? White hot. And they would lay that metal in there. I remember just watching that old blacksmith more than once. Lay that piece of steel in there until it got white hot. Then what would he do? He'd take his tongs and take it over to the anvil and start beating on it with his hammer. Right out of the book. Now look at it. Verse 12. The smith, see the blacksmith, with the tongs, which he picked up the hot steel. The blacksmith with the tongs both worketh in the coals. Well, not just ordinary coals, forged coals with the air blowing through it to make them hotter. All right? And he fashioned it with what? Hammers. Oh, I love this. They, 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 weren't, they weren't cavemen. My, they had all kinds of expertise, and they were expert at it. And they could mold this metal, and with it, they would make what? Idols. That's what they're doing. They're using their expertise to make idols. All right, so the blacksmith fashioned it with hammers, worketh it with the strength of his arms. You know, have you ever seen a caricature of a blacksmith? What has he got? He's got biceps like most pro football players would dream of because he was using his arms constantly either to lift the heavy steel or to beat it with a hammer. See? All right, reading on. And with it the strength of his arm, yea, he is hungry, his strength faileth, he drinketh no water, and is faint. Why? Because that idol couldn't do him any good. Now you go to the other guy who doesn't work in steel, he's going to work with wood. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. Same thing that they do today. He fitteth it with planes. Now you all know what a plane is. You plane your wood and get it smooth. See? 
He marketh it out with a compass if he's going to draw a circle and maketh it after the figure of a man according to the beauty of a man that it may remain in the house as a what? As an idol. Unbelievable. This is Israel. This is Israel. Not Babylon, not Egypt. God's chosen people. Now verse 14. He heweth him down cedars. He goes out into the forest, picks out a beautiful tree, or the cypress, or the oak, which he strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash for whatever use he's going to need. And the rain doth nourish it. Who gives the rain? God does. All right, verse 15. Then shall it be for a man to burn. Now you want to remember, fire was intrinsic for cooking, for warmth, for forging the metal. It had its uses. All right. For he will take thereof and warm himself by the fire, in the fireplace or wherever, and warm himself. Yea, he kindleth it, baketh his bread. Yea, he maketh a god all out of what? The same tree. You get the picture? He goes out and he cuts down this beautiful tree and he's going to use part of it for firewood, but he's going to use most of it to make an idol. Unbelievable. All right? So he makes a god and worships it. He maketh it a graven image and falleth down thereto. Uh, I can't comprehend it. And I don't think you can either. And here are these Israelites, the chosen people, with the temple there in Jerusalem, with the sacrifices going on every day, the priests, the prophets preaching up and down the land. And yet the rank and file of Israel are steeped in idolatry. So does it make any difference to have a church on every corner? Not really. That doesn't make the difference. But it's what happens on the heart, see? We were just talking at break time. Now we can't judge because we can't look on the heart. God is the final judge. But my goodness, we can be fruit inspectors. You can be a fruit inspector. What kind of a life do they live when they're not sitting in their pew? Do they have any love for the Word of God? Do they spend time in prayer every day? Do they share the Word with others when they have a chance? Now, I'm not one that feels you make a fool of yourself and constantly preaching at people at work or wherever else. But be ready, the Scripture says, that when you have an opportunity that you do, but see, Israel was steeped in their religion. They didn't miss a feast day. They were steeped in their religion, but in their everyday life, what were they? Idolaters, depending on idols. Okay, read on. Our time's going fast. Verse 16, still going back to the tree that he cut down in the forest. He burneth part thereof in the fire for his wood, for his baking, his cooking. And with part thereof he eateth flesh, cooking, see, he's roasting. He roasteth the roast and is satisfied, sits down to a good hearty meal, warms himself, and then he says, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And then he turns right around and with the rest of the tree, he does what? Makes a god. It's laughable if it wouldn't be so pitiful. Then verse 18, they have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see, that is, spiritually, and their hearts that they cannot understand. All right, I'm going to take you up to show you something how Paul puts it. Leave Isaiah a minute. Come up to 1 Corinthians. Because, see, whether it's 700 B.C., whether it's 60 A.D. when Paul probably wrote Corinthians, or whether it's 2004, it doesn't make any difference. Not a bit. The human race has not changed one iota. Oh, we may wear a little different clothes. We may have cell phones. And we may have all the other good things of life. But the basic, everyday things of life, no, the human race. You know, I've always made the analogy. I think I used it Saturday in, in our all-day seminar. 
Up until 1860, you could have taken a family from almost any place on earth, uprooted them, and set them down someplace else. They could have kept right on living in the community because everybody still carried their water. They still cooked with fire, and uh, there were no modern conveniences. They still homespun their clothes. But then all of a sudden, in about the middle 1800s, things started changing, of course, getting the world ready for the end time. But you see, for thousands of years, they lived no differently. Now, a lot of you are old enough to remember that at least your, your parents or your grandparents lived this kind of a lifestyle. They cooked with fireplaces. Our pioneers, you all know, they cooked over open fire. They had to carry their water. They had to homespun their clothes. So the human race hasn't changed. All right, now the same way when it comes to spiritual things. I didn't give you the verse yet, did I, honey? 1 Corinthians chapter, oh, it's chapter 2, I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to start all the way up at verse 9. <clears throat> But the point I want to make is that the unbelieving world are just as ignorant today as Israel was back in Isaiah's time. Hasn't changed one whit. But all right, let's jump up at verse 9. Where Paul writes now to these Gentiles at Corinth and to us today, as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Now, what class of people are we talking about? The believer. We're talking about the believer. Verse 10. But God has revealed among us by his Spirit, that indwelling Holy Spirit that is part and parcel of the believer's life. All right, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 11, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man was in him. In other words, we're human. We're just like anybody else. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but by the Spirit of God, only the believer. The unbeliever can't have this. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now, are you getting the picture? Who alone can know this? The believer. The unbelieving world can't put this together. They haven't got a clue is the word that I hear over and over. They haven't got a clue. All right, but that's not us. All right, really reading on. Verse 13. Which things also, Paul says, we speak. He is revealing to us the things of the Spirit of God, which the unbelieving world can't get a hold on. All right? And it's going to come to us not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. And how does the Holy Spirit teach? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And that's exactly why I like to use various references to compare what the Word says here with what it says over there. I think it's God's way of enlightening us. All right, so we compare spiritual things with spirit, and we can comprehend it. We can learn from it. But now read the next verse. But the natural man, the unbeliever, the person who has never come into a salvation relationship, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. They are what? Foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. God doesn't expect him to understand. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. And who gives us the discernment? The indwelling Holy Spirit, which the unbeliever doesn't have. So he's out in the dark. But that's not his fault. He doesn't have to stay there. What does John's gospel tell him? Come in out of the dark. Come to the light. But they don't want to. As Jesus said it, John said it, they love their darkness better than light. All right, back to Isaiah. And uh, 
coming back to where we just left off in chapter 44, I guess we were. Verse 18 again, this is where I got the idea of going to 1 Corinthians. It's never been any different. They have not known nor understood. Now, of course, we're talking about Israel. They have not known nor understood, for he hath shut their eyes that they cannot see and their hearts that they cannot understand. It was a providential judgment call because they were rebellious. How does Romans put it? God gave them up. God gave them up. It was a judicial thing, see? All right, verse 19. None, none considereth in his heart, neither is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned part of it in the fire. Now we come back to that tree again. Don't lose that tree. I have burned part of it in the fire. I have baked bread upon the coals thereof. I've used it to heat the ovens. I have roasted flesh, I've cooked my meal with it, and I shall make the residue thereof an abomination. Yeah, because what's he going to do? He's going to fall down to the stock of a tree. Well, what's he referring to? The idol that he made out of it. Now get the picture. He uses part of the tree for his household needs, the fire, to cook, to bake, but he's going to use the rest of the log for making an idol. And then when he's got it made, what's he going to do? Fall down and worship it. Isn't that ridiculous? Oh, the absurdity of it. But listen, people are just as absurd today. Don't blame the Israelites. They're no different. My, when you see and the stuff that people send me, what people are falling for today, it's unbelievable. And you wonder, how can intelligent people fall for something that is so false, but it's human nature. All right, reading on. Verse 20, He feedeth on ashes, a deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, Is there not a lie in my right hand? Now, verse 21, God comes back and speaks again to the nation. Remember these, O Jacob and Israel, for thou art my servant. God hasn't given up on them. Anybody else would have, but the God of grace doesn't. And so he continues pleading with them and dealing with them. Remember, O Israel, thou art my servant. I have formed thee. Thou art my servant, O Israel. Thou shalt not be forgotten of me. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions. What'd that tell you? Oh, now come back with me. I got time. Come back with me all the way to Exodus. Come back to Exodus. I think it's 33. Exodus 33. Drop down to verse 19, the last half of the verse. And remember, this is just shortly after they worshiped the golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai, while Moses is up in the mountain. You know the story. And in spite of all that, look what God reminds Moses. The last half of verse 19. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. You all got it? Yeah, it's on the screen. Okay, I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I'm going to put the pronoun in, and I will be gracious to whom... I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. What is that? That's the sovereign God. And even though Israel deserved judgment and chastisement, he's not going to give up on them. And it's no different today. You know, the most rebellious sinner, how does Paul put it? Oh, I got time here. Let's jump again, all the way up to Romans. Up to Romans. God hasn't changed. I think I want chapter 3.
Nope, chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I see, I want you to see that God hasn't changed. Really, the human race hasn't changed. And so we're under the same set of circumstances, and that's why we can proclaim these things from the pen of Paul that is just as valid for us today as what Isaiah was telling Israel. The same God. Oh, we're under a whole different economy, of course. But look what God says now through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5. Uh, let's start at verse 19, honey. Romans 5, let's jump in at verse 19. And this was before Israel. This is Adam. For as by one man's disobedience, many, all really, were made sinners, so that by the obedience of one, Jesus the Christ, and the work of the cross, shall many be made righteous. Now verse 20, moreover, the law entered. Now you want to remember the law came in 20... 500 years after Adam, 2000, yeah, 2,500 years after Adam. Moreover, the law entered that the offense, that sin might be seen for what it is. And so the law shows man's sin that it might abound. But now here's the part I wanted. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Why? Because the sovereign God says, I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And so the whole concept is that there is no sin so great, but that the grace of God can lift them out of it. What a message, see? What a God. All right. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now verse 21, that as sin, that plague on the human race, hath reigned like a king unto death, even so may grace, God's unmerited favor poured out, not only on Israel now, but on the whole human race, even so might grace reign how? Through the righteousness and eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.